What's up, Learning Code fam? Here, uh, back at it again. This is Henry. I am reading a blog post on scheduling that Jeff wrote and published tonight. Uh, this is Friday, November 20th. Just so you know, this um, audio transcript will be published on our podcast that will be linked in the description of this video below. In addition to reading some of Jeff's words, I will um, riff and share my own feelings and thoughts about what he has to say regarding scheduling. Okay, so here we go. I'm gonna share my screen so you don't have to see my face. <laughs> Our blog is thelearningcode.school.blog up top here. Uh, we provide um, at least one blog, one new blog post per week on Fridays at 6 p.m for our audience. Okay, the title of the blog is Schedule to Succeed, Plan to Fudge It Up <laughs> by Jeff Anderson. Before each term begins, colleges ask students to sign up for classes. If you are a student who wants to routinely set and achieve ac your academic goals, your scheduling decisions are crucial to your long-term success. Unfortunately, schools seldom provide use full guidance on how to think about this high impact decision. In this post, Jeff breaks down a subtle aspect of making a class schedule. Specifically, Jeff highlights the concept of a fudge ratio, which quantifies the difference between how much time you budget for a task and how much time the task actually takes. We will use this work in later posts on scheduling traps, creating academic calendars, and making your institution work for you. I think it's worthy to note that I have already skimmed through this post once earlier today, uh, and there's actually a learning principle even in that little bit of wisdom in and of itself. I wanted to, uh, one, prepare myself for what I'm about to read um, and reflect on for you all, but two, uh, to be able to slow down some of the words that are um, presented and published here so that I can engage with the actual words in uh, deeper meaning and greater value. Um, more on that <laughs> as we continue. Learning takes time. That was my intro, I kind of scuffed it, but that, that's what I was trying to say. <laughs> like there are some gems in this post, but uh, to really break down the gems in this post, it, it takes, more than one glance through. Um, of course, we all know this, but I think it's important to remind myself, uh, by extension you all, that so many of our classes um, are not structured in a way where we allocate enough time to really learn from them. So here we go. A nuanced aspect of college student life is your ability to create your own schedule. You decide which classes to take, what times to attend, when to study, and how much time to dedicate to your learning. This is an awesome level of autonomy. You can check out my post on the misery of autonomy that is also in our blog. Uh, however, with great power comes great responsibility. Whenever possible, I encourage you to make scheduling decisions based on your learning needs. This entire post is grounded in a simple yet profound principle of learning stated here. Learning principle. Learning takes more time than you think you need. I mean, how often have we thought that something or some task or some checkbox was only going to take one hour, but it ends up taking 10. <laughs> um, so you get the most out of your learning when you engage in slow, healthy struggle. To optimize your learning, make deliberate reaches, embrace deep practice, build connections between new ideas and your previous understanding, think flexibly and creatively, interpret ideas from multiple perspectives, and attentively repeat these steps. I feel like our world would be a greater place, by greater I mean healthier place, if people uh, realized each of these <laughs> phrases in between the commas and exercise them on their day-to-day -day, um, basis. 
Another way to state this principle is, when learning something new, make a conscious effort to go slow, much slower than you think you need to. Ample evidence in neuroscience, which Jeff links to Joel Bowler's Limitless Mind, which is a book that she wrote. There's tons of great summaries and synopses and YouTube talks on this book. This is Joel's, Joe Bowler's, uh, I guess, company, ucubed.org. I guess a nonprofit. Um, and it indicates that we that when we focus on short-term strategies and try to increase the speed at which we think, we can actually impede our ability to learn something new. Instead, the more deeply you want to learn something, the slower you should study. This learning principle has profound implications for students making scheduling decisions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, what sucks out to me in this paragraph is this idea of like, deeply learning something. Um, the more abstract and theoretical our courses are from our day-to-day -day life and day-to-day -day experience, the more time it takes to um, unpack the theory and abstractness of uh, some of our courses, whether that's in sciences or in the arts. So each time you choose your courses, you are literally projecting into your future to impose time constraints on your learning. The problem is that for most students, the act of signing up for classes is like agreeing to marry someone that you've never met. This is not a perfect comparison since each class only lasts three to six months, while some marriages can last a lifetime. But the point of this analogy is to highlight that when you sign up for a class, you are making a substantial commitment with limited insights into the actual demands that will be imposed by the pledge you are making. In this way, the act of scheduling is an estimation game, a high stakes gamble, just like getting engaged. When you choose classes, you are implicitly asking yourself, how much time will I need to spend learning each week during the next academic term? You place your chips on the table and then you hit that register for this class button. My recommendation to you is to think about how errors in your estimate Estimations will affect your learning before you cross the Rubicon and officially register for your classes. Now, the phrase uh, crossing the Rubicon, I, I, one origin could be from when Julius Caesar was about to cross the tiny Rubicon River in 49 BCE. <laughs> um, what's funny, I laughed when I came across the word pledge because uh, the entire Learning Code community has pledged that every bit of content we produce will provide you all value. I realize that at this stage, not uh, we are not exactly fully on target of that, um, but that goes to show that in Learning Code, the work that we do um, is not going to be transcript <laughs> and it's not going to have a GPA attached to us for the rest of our lives. Um, so I think in that sense, it's increasingly more important to schedule for success because when you do hit that button and register and, and show up and pass the, I don't know, one or two week grace period that you have, um, that does leave a mark on your transcript, sadly. Now, the fudge ratio. This is where we can leverage a fun idea. The concept of the fudge ratio, um, I guess followed or inspired by Steve Pavli Pavlina, the man who came up with the terminology. And this is our definition. This is Steve's website that Jeff links to and you can read about him as well here. Um, as we see, fudge ratio equals actual time to complete task, divided by your guess, <laughs> um, your guess of time to complete the task. Another way to put this is that a fudge ratio is a way to quantify the accuracy of your estimations. Let's take a look at three important scenarios for fudge ratios by running through a semi-realistic thought experiment. Suppose you're planning to learn a new concept covered during lecture, sadly, in week three of the next academic term. Of course, it's not possible to deeply learn a new concept in one sitting, but we'll ignore that fact for a minute. Suppose you estimate it will take you four hours to complete this task and you schedule this time accordingly. When you actually sit down to learn, there are really only three 
different possibilities for the fudge ratio. Advantage scenario, where the fudge ratio is less than one. This circumstance results when the actual time it takes you to complete your task is less than the amount of time you budgeted. In your thought experiment, you might land in this scenario if you complete your task in two hours, even though you originally budgeted four. This, that situation will lead to a fudge ratio of two over four, which is 0 0.5, and 0 0.5 is less than one on Fridays. Anytime you create a schedule that leads to fudge ratios that are less than one, you put yourself at an advantage, hence the name advantage scenario. When you are in this position, you complete tasks more quickly than expected and end up with a bunch of extra time. This is wonderful. You can fill that time doing anything you would like, exercise, socializing, Netflix, romance, um, sleep, cooking, leisure, etc. It's been a while that I've experienced romance. So let's be clear, the advantage scenario represents an error in judgment. A fudge ratio of less than one implies that you're inaccurately predicting did you inaccurately predicted the amount of time you needed to finish a task. However, the consequences of this error put you at an advantage. Errors in this type can happen in a few different ways. First, you overestimate the difficulty level of a task and budget way more time than the task requires. Second, you might underestimate your level of preparation and specifically budget extra time to make up for your perceived deficiencies, aka prerequisite knowledge. Or third, you might get lucky and find unexpected resources that help you complete the task more quickly. Now, second scenario, the accurate prediction, where our fudge ratio is equal to one. Another possibility results when the actual time it takes you to finish the task is exactly the same amount of time that you budgeted. You'd find yourself in the scenario if you actually completed your task in exactly four hours and match your original prediction, leading to a fudge ratio of four over four equaling one on Fridays. A life filled with fudge ratios equal to one is just about as hard as you expect. You don't have a ton of extra free time, but you are routinely able to hit the due dates for your commitments. Activities that lead to fudge ratios equal to one are quite convenient since they leave you with the ability to plan your life. These allow you to put nice time constraints around your tasks and move from one task to another with relative ease. Our third scenario, the suffering scenario, where our fudge ratio exceeds one. This last case results when the actual task duration is larger than the amount of time you budgeted. And before I finish that, this set of scenario, let's remind ourselves the fudge ratio is the actual time to complete the task divided by or over the time that we guess we will need to complete that task. So, in our thought experiment, in the suffering scenario, this would occur if you needed six hours to finish a task that you originally thought would take you four hours. Such an error leads to fudge ratio of six over four, which equals to 1.5, which is greater than one on Friday evenings. I refer to the any set of events that leads to a fudge ratio great than one as a suffering scenario. This language relates to one of my favorite ways to think about suffering. That is, suffering is the sense of pain or loss that we endure when there is a difference between what we expected to happen and what actually occurred. You know, Jeff has a beautiful video that I think is currently unlisted called the Productive Struggle Zone um, that gets to this, that puts another perspective on pain. Now, when I complete a task with a fudge ratio greater than one, I experience a definite loss in my life. Specifically, if I only budget four hours to complete a task that accurately requires six hours of my time to finish, I lose time from somewhere else in my life. This might mean that I cancel plans with a friend, miss a scheduled workout, lose sleep, eat processed food, I do a lot of that one actually, especially recently, or compromise some other aspects of my week in order to finish the task. Just like the advantage scenario, the suffering scenario represents an error in judgment. These two types of errors result from the same issue. You inaccurately predict the amount of time it takes you to finish a task. However, this second type of error puts you at a disadvantage, at least compared to your previous vision for how you spend your time.
In order to make up for this error in judgment, you have to find time from somewhere else in your life, which involves compromise, sacrifice, struggle, pain, and agony, and bad grades, which is a synonym of all of that. Um, the suffering scenario is particularly pernicious in the life of a student. Deep learning is, com is a complex process that does not happen on a predetermined time frame. However, most college classes are blind to your individual learning needs. The average instructors will push through large quantities of material regardless of whether or not you've made progress on your previous learning. And unlike in the working world, it is very hard to renegotiate due dates and time skills with average instructors. Um, just a quick uh, tangent to advocate for instructors. As soon as they have more than 100 students in their term, it's very hard for them to address individual needs of students, uh, individual learning needs. So please go into office hours and, and bring intellectual curiosity to the subjects that are, um, and the learning objectives they have <laughs> casted upon us uh, because that's probably like one of the only times you can get them addressed unless you're like me and you like, I don't know, put your neck out there during lecture and, and ask questions, but you don't have to do that. You can go to office hours and, and um, get those resolved. Hopefully, you know, you don't have another class during office hours, uh, times that um, are available, but for the most part, like, even if that was the case, emailing your instructor, I'm happy, I'm pretty positive that they can work something out. Okay, decide your class schedule, plan to fudge it up. <laughs> when it comes to achieving your academic goals, one of the single most important days of my academic term is the day you choose your class schedule. Many students fail to realize how big an impact their scheduling decisions have on their learning. Or more accurately stated, students seldom plan to find themselves in the suffering scenario. To counteract this tendency, I propose the following practice, the practice which is a learning practice, that learning takes more time than you think you need. Uh, what's funny about that is the learning principle that I think I was talking about was also learning takes more time than you think you need. So this principle and practice, as you note, are almost uh, equivalent, which is wonderful. Less to remember, um, just realizing time plays a role not only in principles, but practices. So in order to create a class schedule that empowers you to achieve your academic goals, Hold the following three thoughts in your mind as you choose your classes. Now, this is the more specific practice. Number one, next term is going to be way harder than I think it will be. I wish I told myself that before signing up for my fall 2020. Number two, I am likely not as prepared as I should be to do well in my classes. I wish I told myself that as well, um, but I was overly ambitious and wanted to graduate. <laughs> Number three, I need to create time to work hard, think deeply and be flexible. Yeah, I, yes, time is, like, what is time? <laughs> okay, I am not proposing that you should believe these thoughts about yourself. Instead, do your best to make scheduling decisions as if these assumptions are true. It is pretty much a guarantee that the amount of time you think you will need will not be exactly equal to the amount of time you'll actually need. The question is, what type of errors do you want to set yourself up for? The point of centering this learning practice is to ear on the side of caution. Once you have these thoughts squarely in your consciousness, ask yourself the following questions. What class schedule can I create that will give me ample time to study and learn? How much flexible time do I have in my proposed schedule to deal with fudge ratios that are greater than one, I almost said fudge scenarios? What can I do now before I actually sign up for classes to create extra flexible time to learn, study, and focus on my academic goals? In later posts, Jeff and the entire learning code will address many strategies you can use to answer these questions. For example, we'll talk about how common, about common scheduling traps, long-term academic planning, finding ways to save money on tuition, making money using scholarships, 
and more mechanisms you can use to increase the amount of flexibility you build into your schedules. Hopefully, this will help you decrease the amount of pain and suffering you experience when you hit fudge ratios greater than one. A great way to sum this entire post as it follows, when scheduling your college classes, plan to fudge it up. Do your best to make the fudge taste sweet. Uh, and if you don't like your fudge sweet, then we have some problems. So uh, just a quick reflection. Uh, if you are, there's a good chance that if you are majoring in STEM, you will have to take more than two STEM courses a quarter or a semester to be able to graduate in under three years, actually. So I realize most of you want, well, under three years uh, since after transferring from a community college. So I guess a five-year total timeline, assuming you spent two at the, your JC. If that is the case, if you're gonna stick with the five-year or the four-year total undergraduate timeline, this is a big wake up call to look at your work schedule, to look at your priorities and commitments. Um, because just getting by is really, really painful and dangerous, uh, especially as you work up towards your upper division courses where there's less help, less tutoring, less resources online, um, all of that. All of that is the reality as you're getting closer towards your graduation. So. Focus on learning how to learn. Focus on remembering that any skill is learnable and uh, give yourself enough time to be able to do those things. All right, okay, until next time, um, I promise to do better than this time.